Welcome to World Shared Practices Forum. I'm Dr. Jeff Burns, Chief of Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. We're very happy to have with us today Dr. Brian Cavanaugh. Dr. Cavanaugh is Professor and Chair of Anesthesia at the University of Toronto and the Jeffrey Barker Chair of Critical Care Medicine at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. Brian, welcome. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jeff and colleagues, for this invitation. I'm uh, going to speak on uh, the topic of guidelines and protocols and bundles. This is uh, an important uh, issue in contemporary medicine, particularly critical care, and in fact, in many ways, it's a, an emotional issue. I have no financial conflicts of interest with any of the subject matter of this talk. We'd like to start by turning to our colleagues around the world to ask a question. In your answer, please first state your city and country location. We are interested to find out what clinical guidelines or protocols you are following in your pediatric intensive care unit. For example, do you have a protocol or guideline in your PICU for the treatment of sepsis or the management of sedation and analgesia or any other protocols or guidelines that you'd like to share with us? One of the first things to get right out there is when you question guidelines, you upset people. People have careers in making guidelines and other people have careers in making people stick to them. So when you question that paradigm, you shouldn't be surprised that people will get somewhat upset. Let me start off with two very well publicized protocol guideline combinations. The first is a checklist. It's a bundled aggregate of items that should be checked before surgery. This is of worldwide importance. Sponsored by the WHO, this is the well-known surgical safety checklist. It involves items that should be checked off before a, a patient undergoes surgery. And the idea is that if these elements are conformed to, that the outcome will be better. Obviously, everybody would want outcomes to be better. So Hayes and colleagues, and the senior author was uh, um, Atul Gawande, published in 2009 in the New England Journal the surgical safety checklist to, as they say, reduce morbidity and mortality in a global population. The first table I'll show you here is table five from that paper. And what you can see is eight hospital sites across the world. And in each of these, you can see that the outcomes are improved. When you add all the outcomes together, an aggregate, surgical site infection, unplanned return to the operating room, death, any complication, there's about one third less complications. In those hospital centers, after implementation of the guideline checklist, compared with before it was used. You think, well, that's pretty good. There are no medicines in modern medicine that would give anything like a 30% reduction in complications. So you would definitely want to understand this approach. Many pragmatists in our world would say, look, with outcomes as good as that, nothing more need to be said. Just do it. That's tricky. Because anything that's important is worth understanding. Anything that's to be understood needs and is worth a closer look. On table six of the same paper, what you can see is how much implementation of the key processes was undertaken. On the left column, you see the eight hospital sites. And then you see checking of the airway, checking of the pulse oximetry, adequacy of intravenous anesthesia, intravenous access, airway assessment, etc. And overall you can see that there's lots of implementation. That's a good thing. What the authors did not do was to match up implementation and outcome. If the elements of the checklist had a cause and effect relationship with outcome, then you would anticipate concordance. Centers that had more compliance would be the centers that had better outcome. 
Similarly, centres that didn't have more compliance would perhaps be the centres that didn't have such good outcome. That doesn't prove cause and effect, but it is a necessary ingredient for there to be cause and effect. So when you cut and paste those two tables, the outcome and the implementation, you can see for the eight sites several different patterns. First are those centres that have significantly less complications, that is to say, the desired outcome. And you can see there are three such centres. And then you can say, well, which are the centres that had more implementation? And you can see that there are five such centres. And then you can see which are the centres that had both more implementation and less complications. One centre. So what you have from the surgical safety checklist is no concordance. In fact, there's almost perfect discordance. Don't get me wrong, I strongly recommend every element of that checklist. The idea that you would not check adequacy of intravenous access or do an airway assessment is ludicrous. But you should not think that checking off those elements on the checklist explain the better outcome. Because quite clearly, they do not. I'll move gears from perioperative anesthesia care and outcome to sepsis, very relevant to emergency medicine and critical care. This is a study by Ferrer and colleagues published in JAMA in 2008. It describes a process of care implementation associated with better outcome in Spain. And what you can see here is the survival curve. On the y-axis is probability of survival. And what you can see is that after the intervention, the survival was slightly but significantly greater than before the intervention. The hospital mortality, that was the marker of outcome, was 44% before the bundle was implemented, and that was reduced to 39.7%. You may say, well, that's not much of a reduction. Dead wrong. Sepsis is extremely common, and with a mortality of 44%, any reduction is extremely important. If this were a cardiology study, this would be far and away the most significant finding of the decade. So it's a small effect, and the intervention may have helped but remember, like the surgical safety checklist, this is a before versus after study. The process of care that they're talking about is a two-part care package. The first is a resuscitation bundle, the things that are done initially in the early hours of care. This is followed by a management bundle, specific medical interventions that occur after resuscitation. What you can see here on table two is the compliance beforehand and after post the implementation of this care bundle. In resuscitation, what you can see is that yes, the lactate was measured more often, blood cultures were drawn more commonly, fluids and vasopressors were used more, as was use of a central venous pressure to a target level, as was mixed central venous O2. In general, there's more compliance and more use of the components of the resuscitation bundle after the educational program was implemented. So this could explain the better outcome. Overall, you might say, there is more resuscitation after this bundle was instituted, and therefore maybe it explains or contributed to the better outcome. Therefore, it gets a tick mark as a possible. It's definitely a potential player in explaining how outcome following sepsis was improved by this implementation. When you look, on the other hand, at the management bundle, unfortunately, the situation is not so clear. In fact, it is clear. It's extremely clear because all elements of this bundle either don't work, such as use of generic low-dose steroids, use of active pro protein C, use of tight glucose control, 
use of plateau pressure control, because it was the same before and after, are all management bundles. So none of the management elements can explain the improved outcome, because either they've been subsequently shown not to work, or they weren't used any more frequently afterwards than before. So therefore you would say, well, this is a complex package, editorialized in JAMA, high profile, but only half of it could explain the better outcome. And that's the resuscitation half. So the authors here, I think maybe unwittingly, explain why in fact this is not the case. Because they give us the long-term data. They give us data follow-up at one year. And what they show here, that the mortality got better at time of intervention, and in one year stayed better. That's good. You say, well, this is the kind of thing we want. Institute something, and one year later, it's still working. Excellent. And it is excellent. However, it's not explained by the management bundle, because we know the management bundle doesn't work. None of the elements could possibly explain the improved outcome. Therefore, it must be the resuscitation bundle. Well, that doesn't work either, because the resuscitation bundle was more implemented at the time of the initial improvement, but by one year had gone back to pre-implementation levels. So the resuscitation cannot actually explain the sustained benefit. So the lower mortality in this high-profile study does not relate to the studied interventions. This is not because of what was done in that study. This is some other effect. The lower mortality is very likely to be due to an improvement in overall standards, a so-called secular trend, or to something unrelated, the so-called Hawthorne effect, the effect of being watched or being studied. Don't get me wrong. I strongly, strongly recommend expert presence and expert resuscitation of any individual patient who might have an infection. I don't disregard that for a second. I strongly emphasize it. But when you're looking at before and after studies, particularly those that are widely cited and highly influential, where there is a clear, unambiguous association with benefit, they are equally clearly not representative of cause and effect. And so you must be very clear on relying on those interventions because, in fact, the benefit is due to something else. What is the Hawthorne effect? Elton Mayo, psychologist, social psychologist, examined productivity in the Hawthorne Works plant in Western Electric, Illinois. A good place to examine things, I guess, because he noted that when you dim the lights or when you raise the lights, the productivity increased under either set of changed conditions. And the productivity increased if all of these women knew they were being watched. And that's the same of all of us. When we feel we're being watched or being studied, we're more productive. Or it could be an impact of an improving baseline outcome. In fact, recent data would be suggesting a far lower mortality associated with systemic sepsis than was previously thought either reflect better ways of measurement or true improving baseline. Many people will say, look, this is all theorizing. It is being unnecessarily intellectual. Who cares how this works if it does work? I would say be very wary, be aware of this so-called pragmatic approach. It has potential consequences. You may continue the harmful or useless elements. Examples in the sepsis would be activated protein C or tight glucose control or routine use of corticosteroids and septic shock. Thank goodness we now know that they don't work. In fact, they're harmful. The second issue is that you may ignore or discontinue the factor that does work. Why? Because you have not identified it. Third, it's really hard to advance knowledge if the issues are hidden. Knowledge requires things to be explicit, so you can form an hypothesis and test it. Doesn't have to be a randomized trial, 
but unless you can identify what your question is, you can never answer it. An important element in figuring out whether a protocol is appropriate for your population is the concept of alignment. It's possible the protocol is exactly what your population requires. But if it isn't, you run the risk of misalignment. This is a Gaussian curve showing normal distribution. What you can see on the x-axis is performance. Some centers are very high performers. I won't say where those centers might be. It could be Boston, but I won't say. Some centers are poor performers. And I certainly won't say where they might be. And it's very obvious, it's quite intuitive, that if you're a poor performing center, poor performing because you have insufficient staff, insufficient education or basic training, or do only very simple cases, that the kind of training or protocols that will work well there would be to improve basic training, to be improve basic staffing, to use protocols such as BCLS, for example, and to focus on simple cases. Clearly, not very useful in those situations to use a protocol for ECMO or high-level care. In contrast, in the high-performing centers, you may choose advanced training, you may choose advanced fellowships, you would have extensive experience, tertiary or quaternary care, and in those situations, it would be important that the protocols where they're used reflect the ability to use high-end performance. BCLS may have a role, but BCS would be a sort of a ceiling effect in that context. So different problems, like much of life, need different solutions. It's possible that in translating a protocol that works well in one context to a different context, you can have trouble. Now let me give you three examples where this can be a problem. I'll frame this in the way of three questions. The first is, could a bundle, a group of elements of care that are developed for a sophisticated context, could they work well in a more rudimentary context? Well, here's the Catherine Maitland study. The study of mortality after fluid bolus in African children with severe infection. A study in sub-Saharan Africa, children with severe sepsis were treated according to an algorithm. And you can see here, there were several thousand, almost 8,000 children screened. There were 3,000 children enrolled, and if we ignore the patients in frank shock, we're left with 3,000, approximately 1,000 in each group, assigned to fluid bolus with saline, a fluid bolus with albumin, or no fluid bolus therapy. And the no fluid bolus therapy reflects usual care in sub-Saharan Africa. Note, the bolus therapy reflects usual care in the developed countries. Boston, Toronto, Pittsburgh, shop, everywhere. That's what the bolus care reflects. Well, it turns out when you look at this graph, you think that must be mislabeled. Because the mortality over 28 days is lower for the usual care. In fact, implementing the Western world standards of bolus therapy for sepsis, whether it be saline or albumin, was associated with a slightly but significantly worse mortality. So instituting Western standards, in part, to these children in Sub-Saharan Africa, in fact, worsened the outcome, demonstrably. Why was that? Well, we don't know. Was it the age of the kids? Well, no, we have young kids in all the world over. Was it the presence of malaria? It could have been. Was it the preponderance of anemia? Quite possibly. Was it the lack of access to mechanical ventilation? Quite possibly. Was it ventricular overload? Maybe. Was it the chloride load? Who knows? There's clearly a reason, because this is not a statistical blip. This is a misalignment of protocol intent that seems to work well in the Western world, but clearly causes harm in a more rudimentary setting. Overall point, different context, and there's a different setting. So therefore, 
a bundle of care developed for a sophisticated context might not work well in a more rudimentary setting. I'll ask a second question. It's sort of the first question in reverse. Could a rudimentary bundle impair performance in a more expert setting? Well, how could that be? Here's a study and it's far from sub-Saharan Africa. This is a study from Germany. Extremely wealthy country, extremely high standard of medical care. A study looking at individual optimization of hemodynamic care in adult patients after cardiac surgery. They had 100 patients. It's a small study. It's randomized, strength, but it's non-blinded, single center. So many flaws. There were two hemodynamic treatment protocols. But these protocols were implemented by the same very sophisticated team of intensivists and surgeons. The simple protocol was an algorithm consisting of mean arterial pressure, CVP and heart rate. That's all they had to go on. Of course, in most circumstances, you can look after most patients. Maybe, maybe not can you look after the particularly rare, very ill patients. With the comprehensive protocol, there were more elements. There was mean arterial pressure, heart rate and CVP. In addition, there was end diastolic volume index, there was the cardiac index and there was extravascular lung water. So, simple versus comprehensive, what could you see? The overall complication rate, in fact, was higher if you were restricted to the simple protocol. Indeed, the ICU length of stay was also longer if you were restricted to the simple protocol. There's no difference in outcome, but there never would be a difference in outcome in a small study like this. So, there's a possibility that yes, indeed, a rudimentary protocol may dumb down expertise in a sophisticated setting. There's a third way that bundled care, or protocols, can be lost in translation. And it's framed in the following question. Does care that works in one sophisticated context always work well in a different sophisticated context? Here's the Vandenberg study of tight glucose control. You can see here one third fewer deaths in a predominantly cardiovascular surgical adult population, non-blinded study. This is an extraordinary finding that was followed up by multiple RCTs, including the NICE sugar study. The approach certainly works in Leuven. I mean, the data are true, and the statistics are accurate, no doubt about it. The question is, when you extend this to a more generalized setting, that is to say, Australasian and Canadian intensive care units, what you in fact find is the exact opposite. You can see that the conventional glucose control is associated with a higher probability of survival. That is to say, the tight glucose control made matters worse. This is the problem. I'm not a health services researcher, but if you imagine 6,000 patients, excess mortality in the NICE sugar study, of 2.6%. At least now we know the answer, that in adult medical surgical ICU patients, we should not use tight glucose control as it was used in the nice sugar study. But if you imagine in the US, in adult care, there's about 5 million patients in ICU. About 20% of those are supported with mechanical ventilation and thus would have been eligible for the nice sugar study. Think about it. If tight glucose control caused deaths in 2.6% of patients, that amounts to 2.6% of 20% of 5 million adult patients. That's about 26,000 deaths a year in the US alone. As I say, I'm not a health services researcher. Those data are very crude, but it's not a good signal. So care that does work in one sophisticated context does not always translate to another sophisticated context. We'd like to turn now to our colleagues around the world and ask a question. In your answer, please first state your city and country location. The question is, when a study promoting a protocol or checklist is published in the literature, is there a formal review process in your PICU to determine whether or not to implement the protocol or checklist? If so, what does this process consist of? There are many, many situations when a protocol is a very good idea. 
I would say, when a protocol is mandatory. What situations are those? Well, one is where the concept is inherently simple. If there are only three or four steps to take, do them the same way every time. If the knowledge is explicit, that is to say, everything contained that needs to be done can be specified in an explicit way, that may work well for a protocol. And if there is a need, if there is a need to minimize variability. Here is the result of a task force that I sat on from the American Thoracic Society and Society of Critical Care Medicine and the uh, ACCP, and it outlines situations that favor the use of a protocol, much along the lines that I just said. In contrast, situations where protocols are uh, not such a good idea is where you have competing goals for optimization, where you have complex management, where you have processes that are uncertain, or where knowledge is implicit. Simple idea, titrating rock uranium, neuromuscular blocker, could absolutely be protocolized. Setting up hemodialysis, the last thing you ever want is a resident or fellow in the middle of the night deciding a new way of setting up a hemodialysis circuit or an ECMO circuit. That's insane. You just have to have seen something go wrong with one of these circuits and you know absolutely there is one way to do it. Martin Tobin, in an editorial, talked about the importance of rigidly adhering to protocols in research. He says, the protocol in research must be followed exactly. There can be, quote unquote, no flexibility, no weasel words. It's kind of harsh. He says, the insight gained is the point of the research, not the protocol. The protocol is there so that when you read the paper, you know what was done. If they didn't follow a protocol, you simply don't know what was done in the research study. And therefore, the research, in a way, might as well not have been done. He goes on to say that implementation of the research findings is a whole different issue. You are using the insight gained from the protocol and the study to manage a patient who may or may not have fitted into that study. When is a protocol not a good idea? Well, there are certain situations when it's a bad idea. One, if the idea is too complex to be protocolized. Second, if the knowledge inherent is tacit. And third, if you desire variability. Many people say, how on earth would you desire variability? Let me explain. Tacit knowledge is knowledge that is difficult to put into words. Anything that requires practice is likely to have a high tacit knowledge component. Here's a woodworker, a metal worker, working with a lathe. Well, you can instruct someone how to use a lathe, but if you've ever used one, you'll need to practice for many months before becoming competent, much less expert. This is the aperture in a flute. Many of you who play the flute know that getting high-end fingering is really not that hard if you have some talent, but the hallmark of a superb flautist is tone. And this is a picture of James Galway, one of the better flautists in the last 50 years. And you can basically follow those instructions till you're blue in the face, but you will never ever sound as good as James Galway. Why? Because he has innate talent and he's practiced like crazy. And those issues reflect tacit knowledge. Here's a BMX biker. Try showing a protocol that will reproduce this sort of agility. Tacit knowledge, you may say, is all very well for playing the flute and riding a BMX bike, but is it relevant to medicine? Well, William Osler has said, and you see the pictures here, use your five senses. Learn to see, he says, learn to hear, learn to feel, learn to smell, and then know that by practice alone can you become expert. You must learn these techniques and you must practice them. There are unintended consequences of protocols. Here is a case report by Paul Green and colleagues, and they describe an outbreak of Clostridio difficile, and they relate that to inappropriate antimicrobial therapy for community-acquired pneumonia. They point out that the hospital had a protocol to treat better patients with community-acquired pneumonia. 
and that resulted in a massive overdiagnosis of patients who didn't have it and a massive overprescription of antibiotics to those patients so that the individuals in the emergency room would be compliant with the new protocol. Half of the patients who received treatment for bacterial pneumonia may not have had pneumonia and excessive use of the new pneumonia pl care plan during the influenza season contributed, they think, to the intensity of the outbreak. That means a 10 or 11 fold increase in cephalosporin use and a 5 fold increase in risk of death from C. difficile infection. That's a very, very unfortunate, severe, unintended consequence of what was a laudable goal to treat better community acquired pneumonia. Then you say, well, guidelines work, they improve care, they standardize care. Well, not necessarily. This is a paper from anesthesiology earlier this year, Clapper and colleagues from the Netherlands, and they randomized patients to basically care by usual standards versus care by the, uh, the, the introduction of a protocolized approach. And what you can see here is an overlay here. The standards of care result in a good matching of the need and the prescription of antiemetics. And on the right side, you can see a mismatch. What you see here is an excess of prescription of the antiemetics. So the antiemetic guideline here, in fact, resulted in more antiemetics, but the same amount of emesis. In critical care, Gordon Doig and colleagues in this paper in JAMA, again in 2008, again editorialized with a laudatory editorial, looked at the evidence, use of evidence-based feeding guidelines and mortality in critical care adults. And what you can see, they had 30 plus ICUs that were randomized. In a 27 that ended up being randomized in a cluster randomized trial. And they had important endpoints. In those that followed the guidelines, there was a higher proportion of patients receiving enteral or parenteral nutrition. So more patients were fed. Well, that may be a good thing. And you can see that the energy delivery per patient was also slightly higher. But what you look at the outcomes, you see there's absolutely no difference. In fact, if anything, maybe a tendency towards a worse outcome in terms of mortality or mean hospital length of stay. So what you have with feeding guidelines is more feeding and the same outcome. Can we trust guidelines? Well, I think the integrity and the intent of most people with clinical practice guidelines is positive. But there are situations where you have to wonder. I have no problem with Pharma and pharma's need to survive and grow is a very important part of modern medicine. But you click on Guidelines Central and you click on Pharma and Device sections, you see here society endorsed guidelines recommending your product. Quote unquote, what more could you ask for? This is taken directly from the website. So that's very desirable if you're selling a product. It may not be desirable if you're a patient. I do have confidence in the future in this regard. Physicians choose critical care after a primary specialty, pediatrics, anesthesia, medicine or surgery. Why? Because among these specialties, there is a rich, dense heritage of knowledge that they've immersed themselves in. And this is very important. Patients and their families will expect that physicians have received an in-depth education and that they, they will understand the patient or that they will seek to understand the patient. That doesn't jive well with checking off a guideline list. Why textbooks and why in depth and why not an immediate Google or Yahoo type search of all of the issues that crop up on ward rounds? Well, that's very important. I refer you to the book Proust and the Squid by Marianne Wolfe. And she decries the instant approach to modern medical learning. She makes the point, we are not only what we read, but we are also how we read. That is to say, knowledge acquired through judicious use of texts going backwards and forwards in an in-depth manner is very different to the sort of knowledge that you acquire when you look it up on a Google type search and move on to the next issue. The process, she says, of in-depth reading indeed shapes the mind. When critically ill, this is a picture of a patient from our ICU who indeed was critically ill. This child has meningococcal septicemia. When our patients are critically ill, they are absolutely vulnerable. They need all of the tools that we have available. They need our training. 
They need our knowledge. They need our experience. They need our wisdom. They need our procedural skills. They need our presence. They need our integrity. And yes, certainly, they do need guidelines and protocols. Remember, questioning guidelines upsets people. You should expect people to be upset. It's upsetting. Protocols for use when people procedures are mechanical, first class. Guidelines, you should definitely use guidelines if you're unfamiliar or unsure. But if unfamiliarity or uncertainty are a frequent occurrence, then you should probably consider textbooks, expert clinicians, and more time learning. Thank you. Dr. Kavanaugh, you have uh, many decades of experience as a clinician and as a scientist. And one of the questions I'm sure our colleagues around the world are wondering is, um, how do you stay current in the field? It's a challenge for all of us. It's a challenge for people who are learning the field, and it's a challenge for those of us who are practicing in the field. And that is, um, how do you stay current with the literature? Could you tell us, um, uh, first, what is your reading plan? How do you stay current? Do you have a rigid plan that you, you stick to, or is it ad hoc? And secondly, uh, could you share with us, if there were three, four journals that you would recommend to colleagues around the world that they read frequently, what, what would they be? Um, it's very unkind of you to say that I've several decades of experience, but uh, we I, both I, do, I, Brian. I take the compliment. <laughs> um, it's, um, um, I think the uh, key issue of a reading plan, I think that's, uh, <clears throat> that's, that's difficult. Um, I, have a, I have a very varied professional life, and so it's quite hard for me to, to have a time during, particular time during a day or particular days during a week. But I kind of make sure on aggregate that I at least skim the general medical journals. Um, the, the five main general medical journals, and I skim also, frankly, all of the uh, critical care journals. Um, and you might say, well, that's a very large reading load. Yes, it is. I, I don't, maybe just reflects my bias, I don't um, sort of skim tables of contents for pediatric journals. I probably should. But I am drawn, of course, through secondary reading to much in the pediatric literature, particularly pediatric critical care. So I read the New England, uh, Lancet, British Medical Journal, Canadian Medical Association Journal, JAMA. Uh, I, I almost always read the table of contents and anything of remote interest, I try to make time to actually read it. I think in critical care, uh, I read the, uh, the Blue Journal, American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. I read intensive care medicine, critical care medicine, and uh, critical care. Uh, do I read every paper? No. I, I look at the title. Uh, many times I look at the abstract. But I sort of make a, make a big effort uh, uh, that if the, if the paper is remotely of interest, either in my, my area or rem of interest, even not in my area, but shows an important mechanism or an important perspective, that I will uh, often print that paper out. Maybe, maybe a waste of paper, but <clears throat> I think um, if it's important, you should probably print it out. Um, that's a controversial thing in a way because you have a lot of a lot of paper. I accumulate a lot of paper, but um, yeah, that's important. And I'm uncertain as to whether you should uh, get journals online or journals arriving in the mail. It's a huge paper waste for journals arriving in the mail, but you actually have a far higher chance of reading them. And it's a little bit like the last point I made in the lecture. <clears throat> if you have a paper journal you're much more apt to flick backwards and forwards and to put it down and pick it up again. That process doesn't work so well with uh, electronic media. We'd like to turn now to our colleagues around the world and ask you a question. In your answer, please first state your city and country location. The question is, how do your PICU physician faculty stay up to date with the medical literature? First, in particular, is reading a journal online or reading a journal in print preferred? Second, on average, approximately what percentage of your efforts to stay up to date is through reading a journal online, and what percentage of your effort is from reading a journal in print?
How do you stay current, uh, or how would you strike the balance between uh, your academic focus versus reading outside your academic focus? So you're uh, an expert, and your research has been in the area largely of lung injury. Mm -hmm. uh, but how do you find time to keep up with uh, the latest in renal replacement therapy, yeah. uh, or the latest in uh, bowel ischemia, translocation, et cetera? I would say if you talk to my research colleagues, they say I don't keep up enough with research. If you talk to my clinical colleagues, they say I don't keep up enough with uh, clinical. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I keep up pretty well, actually. Uh, I think that the only way to do this is to put in the time. Uh, whether you do it every Monday, <clears throat> whether you do it two hours a day, an hour a day, but uh, you have to put in the time and it has to be substantial. And uh, you, you simply cannot particularly if you have a research career, you know, the, the level of reading there has to be in depth. In the clinical career, you know, you might want to get away with just the sort of bottom line take home message. It's not great because if it's central to your practice, you should really understand it well. But if you're going to research in an area, you know, the papers left to be read several times. Put down, taken up again, discussed with your colleagues, read again. Uh, because after all, you're, you're basing your next hypothesis and your next body of work in part on those papers. So the answer, there's a danger that the answer could sound too sanctimonious. To say, oh well, you know, like in the good old days or the bad old days, you just have to read for many, many hours a week. I'm afraid you have to read for many hours a week. Dr. Kavanaugh, another uh question that arises, I'm sure, among our colleagues is, um, what conferences do you make an effort to attend uh, regularly and how often now? For many of our colleagues around the world, it's just not practical to be able to get to many of the conferences that you might mention. But nevertheless, we'd be curious to know, uh, what do you consider to be the essential conferences to stay current in our field in critical care? Mm. Uh, <clears throat> uh, two of them. <laughs> uh, I said I had no conflict of interest, uh, and now I do. Uh, so I'll go to the, uh, the most important conference first. I think the most important critical care conference in general is the American Thoracic Society, the ATS. And we're speaking here as pediatric intensivists and one may say, well, there's not a lot of pediatric ICU at the ATS. And yes, that's true, that's true. But it is the conference at which the highest level of science in our field is presented. And that's very, very important because whilst that does not tell you what to do the next day and next week in the intensive care unit, it absolutely shapes the future of our specialty. So the, the best thing to do is to go to a conference that has the highest level of clinical science. Clinical science. It's not, it's not reasonable for, <clears throat> you know, to expect a, a, a clinician practitioner um, to go to a, a sort of a very molecular type conference that, that doesn't make sense, you know. But the American Thoracic Society, I think, covers, covers it all, but at a very high level. There are other conferences. They're more concerned with, I would say, teamwork, and that's important. Um, but it's, it's never really going to advance the ability to diagnose or develop new treatments. Um, and the second recommendation I have for Canadians is a conference uh, I chair the organizing committee. Uh, that's the Critical Care Canada Forum. And all I can say is that other people say it's a very good conference. Uh, so that's a plug. Terrific.